So hey guys, we have Kaval with us. So Kaval is one of the really pro seniors at Mitral College. So he did a lot of yeah. So I think one of the really really cool things which happened was like your company Omni ML. I think you were a founding member in that company. So that got acquired. And then how much money you paid? Is it like financial independence, retire early? That's like I mean, you get paid like what five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars, and then you come back for like thirty, forty LP. That doesn't not a uh, this year has been close to that for sure. Because first year Omni ML RSUs got vested and the Nvidia shares like doubled as well. So, hey guys, the following is a conversation with Kaval Moravia. Kaval is a senior of mine from Bits Hyderabad. He did his bachelor's in Bits Hyderabad, and afterwards he went on to do his master's in computer science in UIUC. Afterwards, he worked in amazing companies like Bloomberg. He started got acquired by Nvidia, which is the currently the fastest growing company in the world. We talked about a lot of stuff in the world of AI. How we as engineers can contribute to the field of AI, and we talked about a bunch of other things, including the compensation that an AI engineer gets. And which is better, just to be a software engineer doing DSA, or should you get into data science? We talked about the importance of doing masters. Can you be an AI engineer without actually doing masters? What are the kind of projects that you need to do to get into amazing companies like Nvidia as an engineer, especially if you want to transition from India to the US? What kind of steps you need to follow? This is, these are some of the things that we touched. This is a little bit of a lengthy podcast. So make sure to watch it at 1.5x or 2x. And I think there's a little bit of mistakes in the subtitles as well. So make sure to ignore that as well. And make sure to turn on your subtitles in YouTube as well. And I'll see you guys. Make sure to enjoy the podcast. So hey guys, we have Kaval with us. So Kaval is one of the really pro seniors at Mitral College. So he did a lot of ML related stuff. He went to UIUC. And then he was sorry worked at Bloomberg, and then now he's at Nvidia, and he worked at a startup called Amna ML. He's got acquired, so a lot of stuff related to ML coming up. So Kevin, K- like, so when I, I was in college, so I met a lot of people who were genuinely like interested in ML from the first year itself. Like, I was not that kind of guy. I explored a lot of Android web and a lot of other things as well. So what was your journey like? Did you like go all into ML from the first year onwards, and then you just navigated through ml or like did you like do other stuff so. yeah i mean uh, first of all thanks uh, hari for having me uh, glad to be here so to answer your question i mean when i joined bits at that time i i had no idea like you know what uh, all the different branches in engineering like what mm-hmm. courses and everything is there i didn't know what machine learning is mm-hmm. till like the end of second year so mm-hmm. like first year i just did like all the general courses you have uh, not just from your branch but like all other disciplines yeah. and then second year is when we started having computer science courses and like mm-hmm. started off with basics of c programming and object oriented programming java and all the all the courses uh, and in the second year second semester i thought of taking the data mining course Mm-hmm. uh because some of my friends were taking it so i took it uh and then i i really enjoyed the content there like one thing that i really liked was like the actual assignment one of the assignments i did like i spent like staying up almost a night and then even a few days before that and just like being able to implement like some uh, data mining algorithm for like uh, association rule mining that was a really good uh, cool experience like that that started me to get more interested in this work of course that wasn't like proper machine learning or deep learning related things it was still like you know uh, like data mining kind of things but still i enjoyed it so i took a lot of other like machine learning information retrieval and those courses in the third year and then you know i really liked working on that i also took up some projects with professors which which gave me more more some some research experience as well and you know all these projects and and like work motivated me to you know go go do a thesis at at Microsoft research in my fourth year also working on some deep learning projects and then eventually do a masters in in computer science and then specialization in ai in the us at uiuc oh damn damn that that's so cool man because i think when i was in college at least there was this, i was very confused because i was not sure which should should a masters if i should get a job because there was a bunch of people who were interested in doing masters and there were people who were doing dsa and then preparing for placement so like did you ever think of like okay should i should go down the placement route because you did an internship for rc shimla as well right so like what, what were you thinking especially at the end of your third year should i go for get a ppo should i go for a job or like should i do a masters what how did you make the decision Yeah I mean in my third years at the end of third year in the summer I did the internship at Arcesium and I uh, by the time the internship was going on uh, I think I already decided that I wanted to go for a master 
so you know i started preparing for gre and all the exams and of course i didn't know uh, what admits i would get and whether or not i'll end up going to those admits or not so i didn't say anything to rccm like you know uh, don't give me a ppo i won't be telling you anything like i i got a ppo uh, and then right in may uh, of of uh, 20 2019 which is right when i graduated and then i already finalized you know that i'll be going to uic for masters and it was like two months before the actual joining at rc zim is when i just like uh, emailed them saying you know i've changed up my mind i'm i'm planning to do a masters i won't be joining rc zim so so yeah i mean yeah. i uh, i i didn't stand uh, sit for placements because when the placement started i had already you know gotten an offer from rc zim it was uh, it, it's quite a good company the offer was nice so you know i didn't feel like i uh, I, i need to apply for interviews and of course like I I don't really do a lot of coding on a regular basis it's mostly like if I want to get a job then uh, then I'll practice for it for a couple of months once I get that I'll I'll stop doing like just DS and things which is it, it's it's nice but I I don't enjoy like just randomly opening up hacker rank or lead code every day <laughs> and doing yeah to here same here as well I mean I studied lead code just to get through placements and interviews not a huge CP guy over here but then like were you not uh, Why, why did you choose not to take up the job like were you like very deeply interested in ai and ml and so you wanted to go through that route or like you thought like maybe do i wanted to spend more time in college like maybe that will give you new exposure to meet new people learn new things so what was the thought process like yeah i mean uh, i knew i wanted to like get a different experience working in the us and studying in the us so eventually i know that i would be going to to us for masters and uh, my profile was quite good so i was able to get good admits so i didn't see a need to you know work for a couple of years and then go for masters like one of the reasons many people do uh, like work in india before going for masters is first either like they weren't sure when they graduated that they want to do mm-hmm. a masters or mm-hmm. second like they they may feel like their profile is slightly weak or getting a few years of work experience might help mm-hmm. boost their chances of getting into a better mm-hmm. university and for mm-hmm. me like neither of it were really the case and i got a good admit so i was like uh, why not just go for masters and then do a job and from what i had heard from seniors and what i also uh, think is true is like getting some work experience d- does help a little bit for your applications for masters but when it comes to the actual job you start after your masters in most companies they'll still treat you as a new grad even though you have like mm. one two years of work experience so it, mm. it at least like starting your first job in the us it doesn't generally help too much with you know getting mm. a better job or a better pay of course there are always some companies that would cons- consider you for senior roles or like consider you for a better pay because of your work experience mm-hmm. maybe when it's big jobs and you have like the the more years from the past to also add up to the to the count and say you know you have 3 5 years of work experience or something oh, okay. so maybe that time it helps but like directly the first job generally it's, it's less of a factor so i felt like why not just uh, start directly in the us before india Makes sense, makes sense, man. So let's talk about your experience in UI. You see, like, how was it like, different from your experience in Bits? So, I mean, in Bits, you got explored a lot of new things. You did a lot of projects with professors and all. But then, like in UI, you see, how was that different? Like, in terms of the mindset of students, because I feel there are a lot of people who are interested in machine learning and AI. They almost nine, they almost ninety percent of them they end up doing masters. It's not like there are very few people who actually like stay back in India and then. who work for ai companies in india because most of them do end up doing a masters or phd so how was the experience in ui uc uh, can you just go through sure yeah i mean definitely going from india to us is a completely different uh, experience just you have to you know uh, live uh, independently manage your own life you know be more disciplined with your life it's not like staying in your hostel and then you you'll you'll wake up you have food in the mess every day you you just go to class and then you work but like yeah so for me like the the bigger part was like the personal 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 development of my mm-hmm. own lifestyle being able to be more you know disciplined and you know financially Uh, being able to manage expenses and all the different aspects of living independently that that was like a very uplifting experience for me uh, in terms of the coursework and and the UIUC studying experience like i from the beginning fortunately i got uh, an ra position with a professor 
so you know i took that ra i i heard from students uh, other students you know that the professor is quite demanding and like <laughs> he he put up a lot of work on you so don't take any like hard courses with it just take some easy courses with the ra and you'll be able to get through it and i had a similar experience like it was so much work and it was like a new domain i had like it was related to computer vision uh, related projects and i had like we didn't have any course back in in bits had about related to computer vision so i had zero knowledge of what a cnn is and all the different mm-hmm. things so it was a lot of learning a lot of reading papers and just like i personally like uh, it was a bit of toxic work environment <laughs> during my my research work so i didn't pay too much attention to the course book but but the project was quite nice the one i was doing with professor it it's like a good you know way to a uh, g- good uh, project on your resume it helps you stand up stand out for some of the so roles if you're applying for machine learning roles so in that case like it was it was something that helped me get a get a good job but uh, uh, in terms of coursework i did mostly easy courses where i know you'll be able to get an a and just pass through and then in the later semesters i did took some courses but i personally feel like doing like a hands on project and those things uh are quite help quite more meaningful than than doing some projects so like uh sorry than doing some courses so even those like courses generally the final like projects general like they were very 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 good experiences and you know many courses you'll have like a final project when you when you get to pick a team or you get assigned to a team so you get to work in a team which is quite nice mm-hmm. and then you know it, it may be like a open ended project they they'll, they'll tell you you know okay uh, that do any project related to the computer vision course that we did so you'll have to come up with you know some some slightly different way than what's like a general project so it in some sense it gives you the opportunity to to somewhat innovate and then you know work in a team so those projects were good experiences for sure yeah i um, mean that kind of yeah summarizes were there other other parts to, the, to your question Yeah like right. so when you do projects in bits and as compared to the level of projects in the US like how how is it different like is there any advantage that people in the US have and as compared to people in India like whenever i see people doing projects in there are people who do projects in college as well with professors mm-hmm. and there are people when you did projects with professors in the US so like in terms of the level of papers and level of the work that you did how how is it different and how is it that a person in India can replicate do that level of work that you did in the us yeah i mean like in undergrad i think at least for for during my time like first two years you don't really get a lot of like proper like specialized experience doing a masters in some sense is helpful like because you already come with some basic understanding and now you can you know get directly mm. into the advanced level courses mm. so mm. those courses generally end up opening up a lot more opportunities for projects for you mm. so and mm. to me it's not like bits uh, india versus us like i think my projects in india and in bits were also quite good but just mm. the, the level of knowledge and capabilities that you have changes over time so like if when you are doing a master i feel like you have more uh, more more areas you can contribute to and mm-hmm. then you know i think one question you asked earlier was why do people do a masters and not do some ai projects in india right so mm-hmm. i think one of the reason i see is like doing a masters gives you an opportunity to work on good projects mm-hmm. from what i heard <clears throat> masters in india didn't seem that helpful in getting more specialized roles Uh, i don't know what maybe that's not the case today or not but in the us like i think the masters are tend to be considered you know more meaningful than than undergrad so if you have a masters and if you have done some like proper projects uh, and and then working with professors is, is an additional plus then that helps you uh, apply, qualify for certain roles that you know may not be may not be open to uh, just undergrads so mm. it definitely opens up more opportunities for you but i think if if you, after if during your undergrad you are able to get you know good exposure to let's say deep learning uh, like cutting edge deep learning work and you are able to get a job directly after your undergrad in in the field you are interested in then i don't see a big reason to do a masters mm. i think you can just do do your job in india and then you can try to you know if you want to work in the us try to get a job uh, in the us or like internally transfer to mm. to the us office or something so like i think i think if if you already have that ec- opportunity to work on th- those projects i think mm. then just going for it makes more sense but otherwise i think masters definitely opens up more opportunities for you mm. got it makes sense makes sense 
yeah so like just after you finish masters like so what what kind of opportunities were you looking out for like were you applying to cold cold mailing companies or cold calling companies and or was there like a placement process especially because there are i've heard that in the us there is no sort of like placement process as such and especially if you were looking for a specialized role like being an ml engineer or something so how do you reach out to companies and how do you sell yourself in especially let's say like as a person who's done just done masters and if you will be competing with people who done a phd as well so how do you stand out and how do you uh, generally reach out to people and how do you get ahead yeah so like you said like in the us generally there isn't like a more uh, standardized uh, placement process most companies like universities will have their career fairs at the beginning of the semester mm-hmm. and then you know a lot of companies will will attend that so you'll just go in the career fair with your resume in your hand you'll just like stand in a queue if if it's yeah. a big company there'll be a longer queue you'll have to stand okay. for some time until you get a chance to speak with uh, one of the engineers or recruiters from the company okay. Okay. Uh, in most cases they'll just tell you to apply online so it's it's <laughs> too much on that but at least you know what companies have openings and what companies you should apply to Okay. and sometimes you know local like companies from nearby cities that are not so popular will attend and you'll get to know them like if you are in the mm. bay area you'll, yeah you'll see a lot of startups from me i was in uiuc which is in illinois so you know mm. in chicago there are so many uh, quant and like trading companies so we saw a lot of those companies come to our mm. career fairs so that way you okay. get to know about companies mm. there may be like 1 to 2% companies that actually do interviews right during career fairs but that's very mm. rare <clears throat> Yeah so um yeah th- does that answer your question was there something Yeah else? like so once that happens so you just apply to another company then you receive a call lock towards it like Yeah okay interview. Yeah so in most cases like you just end up applying to the to the company on their job job portal so you know at least when when it comes to applying it doesn't give you any of any edge if you are in like a top university or like somewhat okay university but like maybe in some cases the the university name will help you stand out and you maybe get a, a better chance at getting an interview or like mm-hmm. if you get an offer then you might have a slightly better pay uh, compared to uh, based on your university uh, so the process is like you just apply online on the website you have to you you have to wait for one to two months and at least to get a, a response uh, i applied to like more than 100 companies because because oh. there's just uh, very little chance of of getting uh, getting any feedback any follow up on your inter- on your application so like you just apply apply every day to new companies so like apart from the companies that attend the career fair i used to just like look out for roles on on linkedin in the jobs portal uh, yeah du- during my masters i used to uh, I used to open up LinkedIn every day, and then you know, on the connections page, it shows suggestions. So every day, I used to send like fifty random people, like fifty connections to random people, and then you know, most of them might uh, accept someday. So the hope was that if I ever wanted to get a referral to those companies, at least I'm I've, I need to start building the network over time. And then if it's a startup, then definitely like applying to a referral, it it helps up a little bit. For bigger companies, at least like for internships. I don't see any difference getting getting a referral or just applying yourself and from like the companies of I applied like about 90% of the companies I still haven't gotten any acceptance any rejection nothing I I don't know what happened to my application honestly <laughs> so that's why you just go on applying and then hope that you know you'll get so yeah. so, so the thing is to apply as many places as you as you can to places as you as you can to to sure. increase your chances of getting any any kind of coding test or anything Got and it. once you get that then it's up to you how well you do in the interviews whoa wow damn that i mean i'm not been to that because like generally like in bits we have this uh, this placements like okay, that is not that we have practice school like we get a ppo or get a ppo there they have some internships and then what we last year like we'll talk to some person maybe a placement unit will help so i mean so in the us it's more like you need to like go out there and help yourself that kind of advocate that will really help you a lot even in the future as well that's mm-hmm. that's great and yeah and suppose let's say like a, a person who's a fresh graduate just like myself like let's say i want to apply at a us based company or any good company to be a, an ml engineer just starting out so like what are the things you look out for especially it's, i'm sure you might have taken a few interviews as well now you're pretty experienced and so what do you look out for let's say in a fresh graduate who's just who has little bit of experience as well but not much what should yeah, you I mean, yeah 
even even before your capabilities i think in most cases especially for us because there are the work authorization rules and all that are so strict so most companies like may not even consider you for an interview uh, okay i think that we have heard obviously you would have seen some exceptional people who directly yeah. go to us for for a job so I, so maybe like if you are exceptional in your work that might help you to at least get an interview and then you know they'll maybe try for the work authorization h1b lottery for you but in most cases at least for us i i see it it is like you how no matter how like a good of a candidate are you in most cases you might not be considered because mm-hmm. obviously there are so many people in the us applying already and they have a good tool so there's less of a motivation Uh, I think for like Europe, like London, UK, those those places, there's generally a much better chance that you apply directly after your undergrad and you know you can get a role. Uh, and going for like as, at least like the software engineering roles, generally like undergrads, uh, at least in in my time, we had less of a like deep learning or like distributed systems and those kind of experience. Like we did some projects, but it's not that. you know the level at which people work in the in the industry at like production level work so like getting sd roles generally are are better like for machine learning thing you have to be uh, proactively doing some projects on your own during your undergrad to build your portfolio and, and like some like mm-hmm. practical experience and that might be able to help out with getting like a machine learning role right after undergrad Hmm. So, what kind of projects? I mean, like, is it like because I'm sure like the technical cat dog classification is not going to work anymore. It's not, and the, this is classic cattle data set, the Titanic Valley. So, the thing you need to go a step above and step beyond. Like, so if how do you go and go and build a profile, especially from an ML perspective? Like, what projects do you want to look at? Like, if someone comes with a resume and says that, you know, what I did this project. So, what will you get impressed by? Yeah, I mean, f- for me, uh, again, depends on the the company you're applying the projects they're working on. So if it's somewhat aligned to that, that that gives you a plus point. But even if it's not directly applied, uh, uh, like related to that, having some like practical experience, something diff- that helps you stand out. So for example, let's say, uh, like everyone does like traditional machine learning projects, maybe some like basic neural network courses, but mm-hmm. in undergrad, it, in my time, maybe the times have different uh, again, but like. we just did like basic tra- traditional machine learning projects like let's say now if someone applies for a role just with an undergrad but you know they have some experience of deploying an ml model in production like let's say you you take some some computer vision model like yolo or any model doesn't matter and you are able to de- deploy it on your mobile phone and you know say like in real time you're opening up your camera and it's doing like a uh, posture detection or like mm-hmm. face face alignment estimation or something so you are you, you know like how do you take an actual model and deploy it on on a device like deploy it in production so that's like something like a, a practical experience because now they'll when you do things in real time or when you deploy it to production there's so many more engineering challenges and technical challenges that you need to face like how do you you know deploy your model on this device how do you yeah. cache certain aspects to make the inference time faster mm. so like doing all these different types of optimizations and things you generally wouldn't think about if you are doing a research uh, general research or like general project like in those projects generally you have a goal like you know given this data set and you have to get, get to a certain accuracy just train a model or something like if it's those kind of things then you don't care too much about the practical use cases of, of those projects like uh, even during my project at UIUC we did a project on you know taking screenshots of web pages and mm. extracting uh, a screenshot of product website web pages and extracting you know what's the price image and and title of the product being described in the web page so uh, we were focusing more you know building our own data set getting a model that's highly accurate but we didn't spend fo- focus much on you know how how do we make the training faster how do we like deploy mm. that model on real use cases like in in the the project we already had a, a data set in a standard format but what if you are ingesting a live inf- like live data from a web page like a user clicks on a url now you mm. need to take a screenshot of it parse mm. the html content of it uh, mm. and pre- do the pre processing and pass it on to your model which is hosted 
life so, uh, so you, you have to serve your model in, in somewhere with some like inference hosting platform and then, then you need to send requests get a response maybe do some post processing again and let's say you want to show the results again on the same web page so like doing all the pre processing post processing and like building the whole pipeline is something i didn't think about beforehand so like doing this kind of projects and getting something to work end to end i think is is a good experience wow that i'm sure that's going to help a lot of people because i'm sure most of the projects that most people build are they're, they're like half they're like this yeah. is not end to end it's like i yeah, so it it it's like going a step beyond it, what's required of the project i think that that helps like if you are given a use case and a, a, a something you need to build just not building it but you know trying to get it to work in in like a real world use case or something deploying it in real time and doing like those kind of things taking a step further than what you were required to do in your projects no matter what the project was you know how high of a scale or how simple of it was but like taking it a step further than what you are required to do i think that will help you stand out at least from the people from your batch and then maybe hopefully stand out from the people from other universities as well Mm, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So generally, there's this like typical dilemma of like whether should I be a software engineer, especially if you're someone who's done CS or something like that like should I go to AI or do C like go into software development. So like, what do you think would be a good choice? I mean, of course, there's personal bias. Like I'm more interested in developing products and stuff. But then from a money perspective, like from an entry level perspective, from a US, how much how much do each of the people make? Like how are Ball ballpark figure. If you're like a good student, just like yourself, like how how much is each person? I mean, in terms of pay, uh, I think software engineers get quite good pay as well. Maybe yeah. like the machine learning engineer or data scientist, there might be slightly more, but I think I don't see like a huge difference. So like let's say. Yeah. talking about the the base and joining bonus and like rsus or equity anything you get like the first year total comp roughly like, you know 150 to 200 so maybe maybe more uh, as well depending on the company depending on the role mm-hmm. so i think all all of these roles tend to get mm-hmm. quite good pay uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to like choosing which one you like so i think mm-hmm. starting your first job generally whatever you have experience in and and trying to go, first start in that field and then you know moving to another one if you are interested in that that makes more sense because you are already good at one field that that will increase your chances so like let's say you want to get into a machine learning engineer role but your profile is more suited for software engineering and you have done some ml courses and projects but not not a lot of experience of course try out for interviews in both the roles but let's say if you are able to get a software engineer role in a com- in a good company and they they have other teams that do machine learning like getting internal transfers tend to be more easier so you know you can <clears throat> start as a software engineer at a company and then you know in a couple of months once you start there maybe reach out to other teams uh you know see if you can switch to their team or you can dedicate like some of like maybe 20% of your of your time working part time with the other team to get some exposure so you know while you are in in a role you are act- actively uh improving your profile for the the other role that you need to get to mm. um, and then choosing the one i think is is again you said a personal uh, aspect i personally like product oriented work where you know we have a clearly defined product use case but the solution to it may not be clearly defined so like i don't like reading papers or like you know building new novel like model architectures and all that uh, so for me like I personally like the the engineering surrounding and uh, like a machine learning use case so like maybe taking a proper uh, like well well known model but then <clears throat> optimizing it understanding you know how can you sp- speed up the inference time of of the model without losing accuracy or you know um, what kind of uh, pre processing op- optimizations caching and all the different things you can do you know how can you write efficient code that is scalable so again focusing on machine learning use cases working on ml working with ml models but at the same time you know uh involving a lot of software engineering work like uh i think that that's something that i personally enjoy so like something in the intersection of software engineering and and deep learning so for yeah. me like machine learning engineer those kind of roles make more sense Ma- many people they are more into research roles mm-hmm. than like a research scientist or like those kind of roles may make mm-hmm. make more sense for them but again until you you start having some project some experience in that you may not know like before i came to my masters i did 
a project related to in in like related to data mining and text and all that so i was like you know i really like nlp i'll do a lot of nlp projects once i got to my uh, my masters i like i started doing a project in computer vision and i was like you know i hate nlp i don't want to do nlp <laughs> i want to work with images <clears throat> that's that's more cool so like working on different things i think that helps you identify what you like and then you know you can decide what type of role you want to get to and a master's again is is a good way for you to it's like a sandbox environment where you can you you can take different courses work on different projects reach out to professors but there's no long term commitment and and it's like <clears throat> when once you start a job uh, you already have a uh, idea on what you like what you don't like and like masters give you the opportunity to to do to do that exploration while improving your profile and opening you up for more opportunities mm, got so how was your experience on the ml i i i read about it i found it really really interesting the way they the way they like increase the efficiency when you take a model you deploy deploy into so multiple hardware each one so you just take and you transform it a bit so how how was your experience like at omnium and it got acquired by nvidia as well so was a made a little bit of money from that but how how, how was your experience <laughs> I mean I really liked the the startup work like I was at Bloomberg for a year and a half I had a really good time there I was that was my first full time job so I learned so much uh, during that time but again like you know deep down I knew I like, wanted to work in a in a startup environment work like not just like be in a in a like well developed startup but rather be early on it and in any startup so I was like actively looking for other startups you know that are uh that have under 10 employees and uh, they they have maybe have no funding or just the seed round of funding so they are still very early on so there's opportunity lot more opportunity to grow uh in your career so like faster growth and just get getting the the visibility into all the aspects of of running a company was something that i was very passionate to learn about and that's something you wouldn't get working at a big company because mm-hmm. you're mostly focusing on the technical side of things but then you know uh how do we get customers how do we launch our first product uh mm-hmm. how do we you know uh what do we charge to each of our, our enterprise customers and those things i think like being in a very early on at a startup you get visibility into all those aspects so that's something i wanted to get some experience into so that's why i was looking for different startups i got some offers uh and of course like if you have already worked for some time and you have good a uh, good experience then that helps you in your next job you you mm. have a lot more you know uh, startups reaching out, or, or or companies reaching out to you as opposed to you chasing them to at least get an interview or something mm-hmm. so uh, so in that case like you know this specific company omniml i really like the 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 mission like you know taking uh, machine learning models being able to d- deploy them on the edge devices like s- smartphones smart cameras autonomous vehicles and like the sensors radars and all those so like being able to deploy on those and and uh you know if you are able to uh, optimize a model without any noticeable loss in accuracy let's say you are able to reduce the size of the model mm. by 30 40% in- improve the latency by 20 30% without mm. any accuracy drop then that's that's a good win for you now that opens up the opportunity to to deploy more advanced more state of the art models uh on on these specific devices which are very mm-hmm. like latency compute constraint devices mm-hmm. so like that seemed like a very good use case to me and and i really like the founders background so that's mm-hmm. uh, you know i ended up joining there <clears throat> again like uh definitely it stood up to my expectations the work i really like, yeah. it went beyond my expectations i just learned so much during during the the time i was there uh and yeah eventually like i think our work was recognized and then we got a good exit definitely though i really miss the the startup days the the opportunity to to iterate so much faster learn so much quicker and then you know have a lot more ownership and uh, like auto, auto, autonomy yeah makes a lot of sense i mean you hey guys i hope you guys are enjoying the podcast if you're enjoying the podcast make sure to subscribe to us there's a lot more amazing podcasts that are coming up a lot of amazing guests just a lot of experts in vr a lot of experts in ai a lot of experts in different different places in different countries are coming up in this podcast to help you give you the best knowledge available so make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out on anything and see you guys yeah so i think one of the really really cool things which happened was like your company of my ml i think you were a founding member in that company so that got acquired so i think you must have had a really really cool exit at that point in time so you can just 
talk about how it happened and then how much money you made is it like financial independence retire early <laughs> that level stuff like or how is it like no i mean like if you if you join like a startup i joined like after the seed round of funding there were only a few full time folks by the time so you know obviously the equity is a bigger component but uh, also with like very early on employees like you have to be a lot more passionate about the the work mm-hmm. to to stay through the journey uh, no matter how long it may take you now fortunately we got acquired and we had a good exit sooner many companies may not have a good exit or may not choose to get acquired they may want to stay independent and you know eventually do ipo or something and again <clears throat> you have to be a lot more passionate about the work as opposed to be like you know being uh, technically experienced for for that specific role because you are you no know, like if you join so early on you are going to work on so many things that you mm-hmm. have to work on before you are going to learn a lot and grow technically so like being able to stand stay through the journey is very important like and you know if you already have some experience in the past and if you are joining a, a like another company you have a good like relevant experience in the startup also is very interested to have you then you know they may also like pay out well in terms of the like the base and and the equity both uh, and again like in many startups it, they generally give you an option uh, of whether you want high base low equity or low base high equity and you know depending on your risk appetite what you think about the the potential of the company you can choose which one you, you want i personally like i i had a good uh, other offers so i had more opportunities to to negotiate Oh. and you know negotiate a better deal uh yeah i mean and uh, again if you are one of like first 8 10 people and not like the first two, one or two then then you still have good equity it's it's not like a really good, good big high amount but like uh again again since we got acquired and I, I, it had been less than 4 years for me so i still need to continue staying at nvidia for the vesting to continue so the vesting oh. for me is going to get continue i don't get anything directly whatever gets okay. vested by the time maybe you get cash out but everything else it's continuous vesting so now i'll i'll get nvidia rsu so it, it's definitely higher than what a general employee at nvidia makes because along with like the the new new employee rsus we also get the options from omniml getting converted to nvc rsus it's like more than twice uh, of what a, a regular employee gets and like we joined in february so the stock is also like more than double during that time so so definitely it's been a good uh, good good journey so far it's amazing man i mean i think moving from omni to ml omni mi omni ml to nvidia so how is the transition like because you were at a startup now nvidia is like a big tech company it's like a trillion dollar company now so like how did that how is that transition like do you have less work to do is it like less responsibility or is it like you know it's still like a startup yeah so like all all of all of like the ing- full time engineers from the startup that joined in nvidia as a new team so we formed our own team so you know in some sense we can continue the way we used to operate with the way we used to work but then also we need to align our priorities with nvidia's priorities so like initially we were focusing more on edge devices and working with customers in autonomous vehicle companies so working with you know relatively smaller sized vision models and different use cases but now you know nvidia's priorities and also generally the 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 like the ai industries uh, priorities are more on llms right so we are focusing on those kind of use cases so like taking uh, you know bert or gpt stable diffusion those models and being able to optimize them for nvidia's customers is is something that we are focusing on right now mm-hmm. so but again like there's less less pressure than what used to be in, in the past because now we have we can we have we can easily breathe and and work mm-hmm. relatively relaxed of course like since we come from that background of working in a startup everyone is is you know well motivated they they knew that they need to work hard at, at a startup so everyone you know is is very motivated working in this industry like the, the use cases are different but in the end it's still you know taking up different models and building a a optimization library that that can be usable by other people for their optimizations so like let's say you have um, you're taking the the like 6 billion gpt model and you want to deploy it to your gpu then uh uh basically will will help uh, through our library will help you you know optimize your model like quantize to lower precision 
um, use other kind of optimizations, like would prune unnecessary layers from the network and do different kinds of optimizations. So those kind of things, like there's so many things you can do on your model. There's like billions of parameters in the model, so you can't manually, you know, try to remove this layer one by one. So you need a more structured and an automated way to do the kind of optimizations and like architecture search for for your models. So like based on your model and on your target data set and use cases, we are hoping to build a library that can that can do the same for you so yeah i mean it's it's still a lot of work bigger models bigger uh, scale work yeah. but uh, relatively uh, i think is less relaxed the couple first couple of months like when we joined we were kind of you know in a transition period so we are still figuring out you know what it's going what we are going to work on continuing from the previous work you know what part of our previous uh, uh, startup work will get continued, whether there's something that will get scrapped and what, you know, NVIDIA's priorities are and all that. So there's definitely some uncertainty initially, but like over time, we were able to, you know, stabilize, uh, have a concrete pro uh, roadmap and product plan for, for the, this, for the end of year, and then, you know, continue working on, on, on this kind of work. So I think now it's, it's been a lot more, you know, well-defined what we are going to work on, what our priorities are, and then, you know what kind of contributions we are able to make and and like already like in a couple of months we have been able to make a huge impact in in india even though in nvidia even though it's like a huge company like mm -hmm. uh, we were tasked with some very important projects uh, mm -hmm. very critical projects like one of one of our work is is going to get featured i think tomorrow in nvidia's blog post so oh, yeah. the first time like the omni ml team will get some public recognition like you know our work wow. We got acquired by NVIDIA and then, you know, we are able to, uh, we are working on so-and-so. So it's definitely, a, a, I think we have gotten a, a good opportunity to to contribute to NVIDIA's uh, priorities. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. So typically when a big door company like NVIDIA acquires something like Omnium, like, so do you use the resources of NVIDIA? You want to contribute to ML models, contribute to development, contribute to let's say the math part of it or any way possible so how do you how do i do it as an independent developer or so software developer or as anybody else or how do you go forward yeah i mean with, with the the new wave of of llms and you know stable diffusion and those different generative ai use cases uh independently working on your own you don't have those resources to be able to work <laughs> on those models so like you need to be at a company which is working on those kind of use cases they have dedicated resources for that that that'll like first provide you a platform where you can continue working on projects but even be even without that i think you can still you know uh like you said you want you're interested in the math side of things so you can you know continue reading the recent paper so you know fast start first with some basics and like more uh traditional like older deep learning models you know how did those model architectures come to be you know then initially they were like general rnns lstms and deep learning models that then the transformer architectures came and they just mm -hmm. like revolutionized the whole industry and now everything is based on transformers even like the vision models they have transformer based vision transformers and all those mm -hmm. things and now that like the llms and gpt uh like level models have come in so that is again trying to revolutionize the 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 model architectures right so you can continue to read about the the uh like the evolution of these different model architectures what are some of the newer things that set apart the current architectures from the older ones you know like let's say you have the the llama model then mm -hmm. what what sets it apart from from the uh, GPT model, you know, why do people want to use that? So, for example, it does various caching. It has more like more more efficient way of doing the uh, like attention computations and so many other things. So, like, learn about those things. Learn about the math behind that. If you're interested, I personally don't really like to read too much about the theory, yeah. uh, like equations, <laughs> math, and all that. Yeah. So, I try to learn more from the practical use cases and like implementation tools. You know, try to Try to implement on your own. I think that's the best way you can you can learn about all the different challenges that comes into when building a particular like LLM use case. And then you know you can start with a smaller model, try to implement it on your own. You know, parallel. How do you par parallelize different computations? And like how do you efficiently implement a model? And those kind of things is definitely very important because this is not just research now you are deploying to real world use cases so you want it to be highly efficient and scalable mm -hmm. and that's something you know 
you can you can you know look for read read about implementations from other other people that are popular try to implement on your own mm-hmm. those kind of things i think that that will help you mm-hmm. build a good uh, like initial background and you know hopefully get you to a, a, a company that's working on like those use cases in real world applications and then try to uh, get more experience through that mm, makes a lot of sense i think that's like the best way to proceed forward because i think most people screw up especially in the part of real dealing research papers and you know, most people they just have this habit of using an already implemented library like skitlearn or and basically just random forest and distant trees and then people are proceed along that line but then i think it really with those people said trying to implement something on your own i think that's like the best way to like just get started and if there's is there a way to like track your metric because like especially when i was in college i was just going through this process of reading research papers but then there was no output at the end especially when i read through the courses of antology i just felt like you know what i'm not reaching is something tangible as in better like you know making an app you know making somebody keeps it so the feedback loop was faster and in case of ml related stuff the feedback loop was significantly lesser because like there's no way i can make something like chat gpt or something that a million people can use so how do you yeah i mean like in terms of the the metric you are asking i think like more than more important than the number of papers you read i think more important is like the number of proper applications on a number of papers you implement the number of like real world applications you build on top of of mm-hmm. existing model it may even be like you know taking uh, open ai apis but building some use cases on on top of that and you know that itself is a, is a good learning experience that it, it's mm-hmm. definitely sounds easy but not not that easy so you know mm-hmm. taking something and like the metric would be the mm-hmm. the number of like real world projects and use cases that you try to build on your own think that would be a good metric and like even if you are just work on two to three such projects then that definitely sets you apart and ahead of a large part of the crowd mm-hmm. so like how do you get to the two three research projects so like what is the metric in which you measure like how good the project is especially if you want to apply to a company like nvidia or something like that yeah i mean that's that's a that's a difficult question but again i think you know looking at what are some popular things in the industry right now you know maybe like you know read maybe let's say uh, let's say there is some startup that got huge funding then you can you know learn what use cases they are working on maybe try to to build a very small prototype of very small like sub feature of their whole product use case mm-hmm. or like take a big company what like if you know anyone who is working on like ml use cases understand what type of you know real world applications your friends are working in or like your seniors are working in different companies and different startups and you know try to implement something related to that because you know if if a company is serious enough to work on then that definitely is, is a good problem statement to work on mm-hmm. and if you have some like practical experience on that specific thing then that's definitely a good good project to work on thing mm-hmm. got it makes sense that that is usually like a north star like okay maybe i'm making an impact like i'm trying to make this make this big feature yeah and if it's like some kind of research paper then you know if it's a very uh, revolutionary paper something that's very you know uh, very foundational in all the other papers you know some some different different attention mechanism different more type of model architecture or something then you know taking those foundational components and being able to build, implement on your like couple of years back if you are able to like implement the transform architecture like the multi head attention i think then that's that's like very important because that sets this a very strong base if you want to build mm. something on top of that you have that very strong base so you know understand what are some of the ground breaking and popular revolutionary you know research papers in in today's state and try to select mm. something from that and implement that as opposed to taking some any other like other paper mm got it got it so again again some other question is follow up to this like how do you go about implementing a paper like how do you even start like because if you're working with a professor he'll tell you like okay this is this, this, this then like let's say you're an independent person like you're just sitting in your home with your laptop like so how do you generally go about implementing a paper yeah i mean if it's uh, if, if we're doing like a, a research profit project with a professor then you know they'll generally have a problem statement in mind some maybe it's very vague but at least some problem statement then you know you can like for for me i was working and in, in like 
like during my bits my project was related to event detection from twitter streams mm. so like taking the the tweets and then understanding what are some of the popular like topics of interest or like events that everyone is talking about from the data set so then you know you start off with some reading some papers that do the same thing like do in the same field and you know uh, understanding uh, like taking some popular papers in that industry or like some papers with good citations and then understanding what other papers are they citing you know mm-hmm. and then if any of those have uh, publicly available implementations or not or if if there's something that you know uh, taking any one of those papers trying to implement something out of it and you know over time hopefully and identifying something that can be optimized something you know maybe there is a paper that uses uh, a a bert model and then everything else can stay the same but you try out with a different model mm-hmm. or you know, try out some different type of you try it out on a, on a new, new data set or something mm-hmm. like taking an existing implementation or like if it's not that complicated then implementing it on, on your own but then trying to tweak some things trying to change certain things and you know if uh, of, of course research is very open and some things may work some things may not work so like trying out different things maybe you find something that works and you know you can uh, build on top of that trying to implement improve it further and then you know hopefully if the results are good enough then try to get a paper out of it got it yes thank, thank you so much man that is a very very good answer i mean that's thank thanks i think that's something that i can actually go home after this podcast and i can actually read a paper and try to implement it that's something i want to do and yeah and if you have any plans of coming back to india like i mean that's generally it's something that i ask every guy in the us like because i think one of the really cool things to do is you go to the us gain experience and you have that experience and you come back and implement it in india do you ever like think yeah, i mean that? most most likely sometime next year is really damn back to india at least yeah for the short time uh, i I'll, i'll try to transfer transfer to, like to india office in nvidia so i can continue working with the same team you know and then see how it goes what that's so cool man oh damn man that is the coolest thing i've heard i mean that, i think i don't want to say stop people from going abroad but then at least like people who are deeply interested in ml related stuff they can at least come and intern in whatever you're building and then you get experience on that It's so yeah cool. i mean like in the us definitely there are so many companies so many startups and working on a lot of cutting edge ml ml projects so you definitely have a lot more exposure working in the us so like definitely come to us work at a company for a couple of years you know gain that experience and that's going to help you and then you know you can return back to india maybe uh, work at another company or do something of your own think that the experience is what what will definitely help you in the long run and mm-hmm. at least today right now i feel like there are a lot more opportunities to gain experience in the us but mm-hmm. definitely i think that's the shifting so you know get the experience and it's a different different experience definitely in india you also get a good experience but it's just like having more data points and more diverse experiences diverse background diverse networks and then with all that if you come back to india then they're definitely better off than what you were if you didn't mm-hmm. go to us Mm, makes sense makes sense makes sort of sense so when you come back to india like they get paid the based on the uh, india stuff yeah i mean because like i mean you get paid like what 500 to 600 thousand dollars and you come back like 30 40 lp that doesn't not uh, doesn't really match right I mean, 500 600 base i don't think anyone gets that the base generally okay you know total comp yeah. okay total comp uh, this year has been close to that for sure because uh, the my my stocks like at least like the first year omni ml rsus got vested and the nvidia shares like doubled as well so hopefully if it stays that level then then yes yeah. um otherwise like the base part i think most times and even like many years later like 3400 maybe and like if it's under 5 years then maybe you get to 250 300 depending on the company maybe maybe more as well but like isus in the stocks i think is is what generally tends to outweigh the base over time mm. you start off with a higher base in the maybe the isus in the first year mm. would a general general new higher than like the, let's say the base is 150 and mm. the stock part is like 30 40k per year or something and then you get new refreshers on over time you, you get new isus if you switch a company then the new company you'll get 
new RSUs granted. So that'll that'll increase more quickly than the base part. Mm, got it. Got it. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. And thank you so much, man. Thank you so much, Kevin. I mean, it was a great insightful session. I think I got to learn a lot, and I'm sure people who are watching this day also get to learn a lot. Man. I'll hope I'll hope to see you in India. I mean, if you come, I'm sure you'll come to Bangalore. Or India. I'm not sure where. It's yeah, going. absolutely. Yeah, so if you're in Bangalore, then I'll be here. I don't think I'm. I don't think you come in the US. They're looking to hire people in India, and I don't think I'm leaving India anytime soon. So, yeah, we'll we'll catch up for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, Hari, for having me. Nice chatting with you. Hopefully, you know, some part of this conversation will help someone. That's that has been my hope already. Always to you know being able to uh, help people, answer the questions, guide them, give them some advice, and you know, being able to. Uh, like give some valuable something valuable back to me. Yeah. So like what do you do in your free time? I think I saw your Instagram reel about Niagara Falls. I think it went really viral and stuff. So what else do you do apart from working on hardcore ML stuff? Yeah, I mean past uh past year I think I I really love traveling so I tend to travel quite often to different, you know, national parks, different cities in the US with my friends. And you know, I I've over time i think i have like just uh, had a lot more passion to to travel along with it like building uh, making instagram reels and like mini blogs and something out of it i really really enjoyed it it's a lot of fun like uh, being able to catalog some of the best moments from from your life and you know looking back in the future uh, looking back at all the fun places you visited the fun memories you have with your friends it's something i really really like so that's you know that's motivated me to like make good good reels on instagram so definitely it's something i spend a lot of of my time into so definitely uh, follow at the red kevel morivia 97 if you are into all that yes man i'm sure everybody will follow yeah follow this guys make sure guys <laughs> <laughs> you won't yeah. see any ai related uh, things on instagram <laughs> for that yeah. I tend to post on LinkedIn sometimes, but yeah. I like to keep yeah, my Instagram I, I you, yeah. my passions. Yeah, I think I'll post a GitHub link in the description as well. Yeah, that will yeah. really help a lot of people as well. Yeah. So, anything else apart from you do? Like, I mean, traveling and then this work. Apart from that, like, do you hang out, clubbing, beaches, girls, drugs? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm not a uh, not a party person. But I love hanging out with my friends, so you know we'll just get together, play a lot like board games. Okay. So on the weekend we'll get together, like mm-hmm. play cards, board games, you know, or or just like cook something together. Like we do a lot of like potlucks and and dinners. So like mm-hmm. everyone gets together, we'll try to make some new dish and all that. Uh, I also like love watching movies. So like every week, at least once once to twice a week, at least this summer there's been so many good movies coming in. So like every week. at least twice a week i see myself in a theater watching movie <laughs> uh, i i really love movies and tv yeah. shows so like i tend to spend a lot of time there and then i also in yeah <laughs> yeah man yes thank you so much man and yes i hope you hit like 1 million in instagram and stuff man do a lot of cool instagram stuff 